So my name is uh, yeah, Dave Hackens. Um, I'm a designer from the Netherlands, which is there. And today I'll talk a little bit about the stuff I, I do, and a little bit back forward a few years uh, to explain a little bit the thinking behind the projects. Um, it's basically when I start something, I just like to start with a problem. So back in design school, I uh, was looking at a pen and realized a pen is basically just ink. That's all you really need to write, and the rest is just there to hold the ink. Um, but in a way, you don't really need it, and in the end, you just throw that all away, which doesn't really make sense. I was thinking maybe we could do that different. So maybe we could make a pen that you can eat. So uh, in the end, when you finish the ink, um, you also ate the pen, so you don't have any waste. Um, <laughs> You could also have like different flavors and stuff. Um, so it's like, okay, kind of like this kind of stuff. Um, but now I go graduating, so now I need to think of something a bit like bigger. Um, so I started looking into this problem, which is e-waste. So basically, um, well, I guess most of you have a smartphone, and every few years you throw it away because it gets uh, slow or something is broken, so you just get a new one, which generates a lot of waste. So I was looking into this, like, what, what, what could we do about this thing? Um, so I was thinking maybe it's cool to have a modular phone, so a phone that you can replace uh, and upgrade parts. So if something breaks, you can just replace that component. If it's slow or you want a better camera, you can just upgrade that thing. So you don't throw the whole thing away, but only the thing that you, you don't like anymore that's broken. Um, so uh, basically you have a lot of different modules and you could customize your own phone. And, uh, but I was just a design student, so uh, it was kind of like, what do you do with a phone? It's kind of complex to make. So um, I just put it online and hoping if people support it, companies would make it because they see a lot of people want to have it. So when this thing went online, it was kind of uh, big. A lot of people supported it. So I also got in touch with companies around the world. And one of them was uh, Google. So they actually said, oh, that's kind of cool, modular phone. Um, um, let's make one or work on one. And it was a very experimental project, and I went back and forth to Google a few times. And for me, this, this project was always like a, I don't know, a 20-year vision. Like, maybe in the future, hopefully, we would have a modular phone, but it's super complex to make. So it was kind of ambitious from Google to just say, well, let's fuck it, let's just do this, and uh, we'll do it in two years. And so I was super surprised that they actually managed to pull this, this one off. Um, but then, at some point, Google was like, OK, we're going to focus more on software, and we're going to stop the hardware projects, which means uh, stuff like the Google Glass they had, um, but also this one, like it was just not in their uh, vision anymore. So they just throw the whole project away. Um, so I was like, wow, that's kind of uh, impressive, as in a bummer that they throw the whole project away, but also the amount of resources they put into this. I mean, I've been sitting there sort of on the sidelines, seeing them pouring millions in it, working with a team of 200 people on this thing, and then just by some people in the company or stakeholders saying this is not the direction, the whole project is kind of, um, yeah, away. And um, I think I learned a, a, val uh, a valuable lesson there, that, that it's kind of tricky. If you want to make something, and you just put it in the hands of a few, I mean, it can also just die, uh, because it's just a decision of a few people. Um, now, this project, uh, like I said, for me, was always like a, a more of a bigger vision in the future to work towards. So you still have companies nowadays that make more modular stuff, like LG as a, a modular phone, or the new Fairphone is more modular. And I think that was, for me, always more the idea behind this project, like hoping it would inspire sort of the industry to go towards more modular thinking. Um, but yeah, I think the lesson I learned, like I mentioned, is really like you need to build stuff bottom up because that's when you get a strong foundation and where you can really build something that lasts, that doesn't just die. So um, after this project, I was like, okay, I need a new topic to work on. And I was kind of interested by um, plastic waste. And since everyone is giving gifts and stuff, I figured, um, yeah, I'll bring some. Hence this red thing. <laughs> So, yeah, this is like plastic waste. I guess we're all kind of familiar with it in these days. Um, you can take one if you want later on. I'm totally okay with that. Um, but I started working on this project when I heard that uh, less than 10% of all the plastic we use gets recycled. And we produce millions of tons each year, so most of this plastic ends up in... Uh, 
is getting burned, it goes to uh, the landfill or in the ocean. And basically, all ways are kind of shitty. Um, so I was looking at this material. So when you have like plastic waste, you can kind of chop it into small pieces and heat it up and mold it into something new. So I just started going around to see if I can understand this problem from visiting the companies uh, that make the plastic, that turn it into products, where it's being shipped, where the machines that make the products are being made, um, the transport in the end, and also the part where uh, the waste ends up and how it gets recycled. Just to understand the problem and see where I could do something. Um, so I can briefly explain you how this thing works with my laser. So basically, um, first stuff goes into production, then it goes to a shop, uh, you buy it, you use it, and then you throw it away. So I was interested in this 10% that gets recycled. So basically, it goes to a truck that picks it up, goes to a company that sorts it out, another company that washes it, another one that shreds it, then to a stabilizer, and then back in production, which is basically just a lot of steps, a lot of work. It's easier to just buy new plastic. So I was thinking, what if you could make this easier? What if you could bring it to a guy like me, I take care of it, and then it goes back into production? <laughs> um, but then I was thinking, like, well, you can't, you can't really do anything with plastic, because if you want to make something from wood, you get a saw and a hammer, and you just start building something. If you want to make something from metal, you get a grinder or a welding machine. But in plastic, we don't really have the tools. The, the, if you want to work with plastic, it's only the very big industry that does it, or, or not, no one, really. Um, so I was looking into maybe I should make these machines. Um, and I, I really wanted these machines to be able to build all over the world. So I first started with a big material research. So this is in uh, Ghana. Um, but also to see what, how, how people build machines around the world. So not just me in the Netherlands, but really uh, what kind of bearings do they use? Can, can they do welding? What kind of bolts and nuts they have? Uh, just to make it a bit more universal. Um, so in the end, I designed four machines. Uh, you have an injector machine, an extruder, a shredder, and a compression. Basically, in the shredder, you throw the plastic in and uh, you chop it into small flakes. And with the other machines, with some heating and pressure, you mold it into something new. Um, so that's sort of the machine part. But then I also kind of need to learn about plastic because uh, when I had a bottle, I didn't really know what, what this is and that there are different types of plastic, that the bottle is from PET and the cap is from HDPE, which has a different melting temperature. Um, by now, I know this stuff, but I didn't when I started. Um, so also, wh what is up with all these different types of plastic? Um, and if you melt it, how do the colors flow? Um, if you melt it, doesn't come out the same way as you planned it. Um, so there was just a lot to experiment and learn about the material itself. Um, and I can explain how the machines work, but I also have a little video which probably explains it much better. So. I would say let's watch the video.
Thank you. Um, so stuff you can make with the machines are things like um, bowls or clipboards, uh, beams, so you can build stuff, um, an iPhone case, uh, some tiles, just examples of things you could do. In the end, there's a lot of possibilities. Um, but this is just me and my workspace in the Netherlands, but plastic waste problem is everywhere in the world. So uh, the, I would say the crucial part of the project is that uh, it needs to happen like everywhere. So all the technical drawings and blueprints are shared open source online for free. So everyone in the world can uh, download uh, the manual on how to build this machine yourself. Um, but also really uh, not just a, a complex technical drawing, but also step-by-step -step instruction videos, uh, like how to build the machine, also lessons about plastic, like what are the different types, what are the melting temperatures, some stickers that help you out to sort it. Really this complete package on how to recycle plastic. And um, well, the fun thing is that once you put it online, everyone can, can use it. Um, so throughout the time, you see people uh, building their own versions of these mach machines. Um, building shredder machines. I think this is a guy in Brazil. Um, uh, a set built in South Korea. Students in Budapest. Uh, some guys in Uganda. Uh, students in Mexico that use it more to learn about plastic. Uh, makerspace in China. Uh, some people in Indonesia. Um, some guys in Spain. Uh, some guys in Indonesia that use it to educate kids. And uh, that's also, the, the machines are used very diverse. On the one hand, really to educate people, but also really to set up a little business where they produce things, or to just experiment and learn, and, and learn more about plastic and push the limits on what else you could do with it. Um, and it's also used by companies, so usually they don't really ask, they just take it, which is okay, but um, then our community sends a picture. So I don't know if you know Lush, they make like soaps and stuff. They build our extruder machine, um, so then someone usually in our community says, hey, I've seen your machine somewhere. Um, or Corona recently used it as well uh, to set up a recycling studio. Um, and for us, anyway, it's all good. We don't really care who uses it or for what purpose. As long as more people recycle plastic, we're, we're happy. Um, and you also have people that uh, build the machines and improve them. That's when it gets exciting for me. Um, but they also sell them, so they really turn it into a business of a machine builder selling uh, his machines. And this is something actually we really like, that it becomes this marketplace around uh, plastic recycling, that you can actually make money out of plastic waste. Um, so we also uh, recently built this uh, bazaar, it's like an online marketplace where people can buy and sell stuff related to this. So on the one hand, machines, so if you cannot build them yourselves, you could buy them. Um, and the upside is you can also really buy them locally, so it's not one company in China that chips machines all over the world, but you can really look locally like who can build a machine, so if something breaks, you can also go back to that person. Um, but you can also sell the objects you make there. Uh, so really, the, the, the workspaces that uh, make something actually can make their living out of it. Um, and that's something I always try to do, to just make plastic recycling a bit more accessible or easier to start, um, to create different products with it. Um, so one thing we recently made as well uh, is like a map, so the world map, I guess you're familiar. Um, so we mapped out all the people around the world that set up like a workspace like this. I think it's now around 300, uh, with a new one like coming up every week. Uh, again, we only know it if people share a picture back, maybe more people started than we, we don't know. Um, so yeah, we just, if they tag us on Instagram or something, we know it. Um, but recently, we also made this feature that um, if you want to get started, you could add your pin as well. And we did this because we noticed many more people want to get started, but it can be a bit overwhelming. So with this map, you could see uh, you live somewhere locally, let's say I'm in Bali. You could see there are five people around me that also want to get started, but one is a machine builder, the other one might be good in marketing, and the other one is good in design. So trying to bring people together locally to actually start uh, something like this. So here, for instance, is in uh, Cape Town. Uh, looked it up this morning. Uh, apparently, a lot of people want to get started as well. Um, so yeah, I think also, on the one hand, we, we have quite some people recycling, but there's also still peanuts compared to how big this problem is. Um, so right now, we're actually developing a new version of this project. Um, so in the coming year, we started in September, and October will we be ready. 
We're now in the Netherlands with 40 people from around the world. We in invited them and asked if they wanted to help, from machine builders, engineers, uh, web developers, graphic designers, to really all come together and, and improve everything so that yeah, more people start recycling. So that should be online uh, in October. And the project's called Fresh Plastic, by the way. Um, yeah, so this, this was the plastic project. And now recently, I uh, actually started a new project. Um, so when I was thinking of fresh plastic, I, I like working on it, and I think it makes sense, but I always have this underlying thought that I always have difficulties like, what are you actually going to make in the end? So I like the whole part of the, the machines, the platform, but in the end, you just always need to make something, you need to sell it, and you need to make money out of that. Um, and I think that is sort of, I don't know, a little bit wrong, this capitalistic approach of solving problems, because you sort of touch it on the surface, but the underlying structure of the problems feels like it's unchanged. And I was also looking at my own life, um, like, what, I, I leave quite a big footprint, because on the one hand, I live in the Western world, which can be quite polluting, but just in general, if you, did, if you have a commute to work every day, or the energy you use come from fossil fuels, or uh, the, the food I buy in the supermarket and the bananas coming from Colombia. Uh, so in a way, just by living, I live quite a big footprint, and I don't like it. And I was thinking, I, maybe that, that can be better as well. Um, so my plan, I guess, for the coming years is to try to figure out that part of life. So by really looking into your own energy supply, no, okay, so basically, <laughs> The plan is to buy a piece of land somewhere and really prototype these things. So trying to figure out like how can you manage your own energy supply? How can you get your own food supply? Uh, can you build a house that is not from concrete that you cannot recycle, but how can you make uh, reusable materials or biodegradable materials? And I think there's still so much to learn in, in this world. And I think it's also needed for the, the next step of mankind, like figuring out how we actually work and live in a sustainable way and um, it's a huge topic, and it's probably going to fail as well. But I think the crucial part is that it's just like precious plastic. Everything what we do and learn here, we're going to share it open source online. So everyone can learn from it. So maybe we would fail, but someone else builds on top of that, and then someone else on that. But I do think it's, well, maybe it's just me, but it feels like it's, it's sort of uh, something we need to figure out to really tackle problems on a, on a deeper layer. Um, so yeah, I'll probably be busy with this one for the coming 30 years. Um, the plan is, well, I'm a Dutch guy, so I, I kind of want to do this in the Netherlands, but it's also very difficult with rules and regulations. So we're now looking more into South Europe, Portugal, to be more specific. But then again, Cape Town is also kind of nice in South Africa. <laughs> so I don't know, if you have a piece of land laying around, let me know, we're still looking. <laughs> um, and that was my presentation.